Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to Topic 3.7.1, Inheritance from the AQA A-Level Biology Specification. As always, let's start with a look at our specification. We will start by defining the terms genotype and phenotype, and then move on to alleles and how they may be dominant, recessive, or codominant. We should also know that in a diploid organism, the alleles at a specific locus may either be homozygous or heterozygous. We should then be able to use fully labeled genetic diagrams to interpret or predict the result of monohybrid and dihybrid crosses involving dominant, recessive and codominant alleles, as well as crosses involving sex linkage, autosomal linkage, multiple alleles and epistasis. Finally, we should be able to use the chi-squared test to compare the goodness of fit of observed phenotypic ratios with expected ratios. So let's make a start. First of all, we need to be able to define the terms genotype and phenotype. The genotype is the genetic constitution of an organism. The phenotype is the expression of this genetic constitution, i.e. of the genotype, and its interaction with the environment. Next, we need to know about alleles. Alleles are different forms of the same gene. Note that there may be many different alleles of a gene, but most plants and animals only carry two alleles of each gene, one from each parent. The order of bases in each different allele is slightly different. Alleles may be dominant, recessive, or codominant. A dominant allele is one that, if present, is expressed in the phenotype even when there's only one copy present. A recessive allele is an allele whose characteristic only appears in the phenotype when both copies are present. Codominant alleles are ones that are both expressed in the phenotype. Neither one is recessive. We'll cover more on codominance later on. Note that in a diploid organism, the alleles at a specific locus may be homozygous, which is when both alleles are the same, i.e. both dominant or both recessive, or heterozygous, i.e. the two alleles are different. Next we need to know about mono and dihybrid inheritance. Monohybrid inheritance is the inheritance of one single character controlled by a single gene. Usually there are two alleles of each gene. For example, the gene for color of flowers, F, may have two alleles. The dominant one codes for pink flowers and the recessive allele codes for white flowers. Note that the specification wants us to be able to use fully labeled genetic diagrams to predict the effects of monohybrid and dihybrid crosses. So what does this actually look like? Here we have an example. We have two parents, both of which are heterozygous, meaning that they have two different alleles, one dominant and one recessive. We can use an uppercase and lowercase f to represent their two alleles. We can use this to predict the genotype of the gametes and then use this to predict possible genotypes of the offspring using what is called a Punnett square, which allows us to predict the various genotype combinations that we may have and also the probability of each occurring. In this example, we have one homozygous dominant, two heterozygous and one homozygous recessive. Overall, this means that we have a 25% chance of a homozygous dominant offspring, a 50% chance of a heterozygous offspring, and 25% chance of a homozygous recessive offspring being produced. Finally, we can use these genotypes to predict the possible phenotypes of the offspring. In this example, we will produce some offspring with pink flowers and some with white flowers. Three quarters, or 75%, of the offspring will have pink flowers because, as you can see, even though there is a recessive white flower allele present in these two, the allele for pink flowers is dominant, so the allele for pink flowers will be expressed. And 25% will have white flowers. It's really useful to be able to structure your answers in this way in exams, draw your Punnett square, and often they will actually guide you through the structure anyway. So that was monohybrid inheritance and we now also need to be able to predict the outcomes of dihybrid crosses. So what is dihybrid inheritance? This is the inheritance of two characteristics controlled by two genes. Dihybrid inheritance involves two genes on two different chromosomes. When predicting the outcomes of dihybrid crosses, we work by similar principles to before with monohybrid crosses, but because we have two genes involved, it makes the whole process a bit more tedious. For example, here we have two parents. One parent with the genotype uppercase T, uppercase T, uppercase R, lowercase R, and the other has uppercase T, lowercase T, uppercase R, lowercase R. When working out the genotypes of the gametes, we write down all possible combinations. 
I found it useful to just start with one allele on the left and combine it with both on the right and then repeat this for the second allele. In the example of parent one, we could do uppercase T, uppercase R, or uppercase T, lowercase r, or uppercase T, uppercase r, or again, uppercase T, lowercase r. We repeat the process for parent two. We can then do a Punnett square again to work out the genotypes of the offspring. We then identify what percentage of each different genotype is present, and then work out what different phenotypes are present. In this case, the different genotypes present will result in only two different phenotypes in the offspring overall. One group will have broad seeds and large petals, the other broad seeds with small petals. We can also work out the percentage of each phenotype that will be present. 12.5% plus 25% plus another 12.5% plus 25% makes 75% overall that have broad seeds and large petals and 12.5% plus 12.5% that makes 25% of the offspring will have broad seeds and small petals. Next we need to know about codominance. In codominance both alleles will be expressed in the phenotype. Neither one is recessive. There are three possible phenotypes, one caused as a result of homozygous of one allele and the other by the homozygous of the other allele and one caused as a result of being heterozygous. For example, imagine we have two codominant alleles, uppercase R codes for red fur, uppercase W codes for white fur. We can have three possible genotypes and three possible phenotypes. Homozygous of the allele for red fur results in red fur. Homozygous of the allele for white fur results in white fur. And we can also have heterozygous, i.e. we have both codominant alleles present, meaning that both alleles are expressed in the phenotype, resulting in pink fur. Next we need to know about multiple alleles. Some genes have more than two alleles. For example, blood type is coded for by a gene which has three alleles. Type IA, which codes for type A blood, type IB, which codes for type B blood, and type IO, which codes for type O blood. Note that types A and B are codominant over allele IO. Overall this means that there are four possible blood phenotypes. If we have homozygous type IA or heterozygous IAIO blood, this will result in type A blood. If we have homozygous IBIB or heterozygous IBIO, this will then result in a type B blood. If we have homozygous IOIO, then this results in type O blood. And finally, if we have both codominant alleles IA and IB present, they are both expressed and we will have type AB blood. We also need to know about sex linkage. A gene that is found on a sex chromosome is said to be sex-linked. Most genes on sex chromosomes are carried by the X chromosome. Because males only have one X chromosome, they often only have one allele for sex-linked genes. Because they only have one copy of the gene, they express the characteristic of this allele even if it's recessive. Therefore, males are much more likely to show recessive phenotypes for sex-linked genes. Let's have a look at an example of a cross involving genes that are sex-linked. For example, the disease haemophilia. The gene which determines if you have haemophilia is found on the X chromosome, and so is sex-linked. If you have the dominant allele, you are healthy, and haemophilia is caused by the recessive allele. Because males only have one X chromosome, they only need one copy of the recessive haemophilia allele for it to be expressed. Let's have a look at an example of a cross between two individuals. The mother has two dominant alleles, and the father has one recessive haemophilia allele. We can do a Punnett square again to work out the possible genotypes of the offspring. You can see that here we have two females which, although they are healthy, they each carry one recessive haemophilia allele. Note that if someone has the faulty recessive allele but is heterozygous with a dominant allele present so that the recessive faulty trait is not expressed, they are said to be a carrier. We would also have two healthy males. In exams, when asked to explain why males are much more likely to show recessive phenotypes for sex-linked genes, remember to refer to both males and females, stating that females may be carriers, whereas males only require one allele. Then we have autosomal linkage. Autosomal genes are ones that aren't found on sex chromosomes. Genes on the same autosome are said to be linked. They will stay on the same chromosome during independent segregation in meiosis 1 and offspring will inherit these alleles together. This is except for if they're separated during crossing over. The closer together two genes are on the same chromosome, the less likely they'll be split by crossing over. 
So we can see the effect that linkage has on crosses. If we have a normal cross, we would get offspring with this genotype combination. But when two autosomes are linked, they are not separated, and we just get the same combination. Note that this means that if two autosomes are linked, you won't get the phenotypic ratio you'd expect from the offspring of a normal dihybrid cross. So just to show you an example, if we have a dihybrid cross where both parents are heterozygous, you'd expect there to be a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio in the different possible genotypes of the offspring. However, with autosomal linkage, you would get a 3 to 1 ratio because the two linked alleles are inherited together. Autosomal linkage means that a higher proportion of the offspring will have their parents' genotype and phenotype. To recap crossing over, just follow the link to one of my previous videos top right. Then we have epistasis. This is the effect of one gene upon another. The two genes interact so that one may be masked, i.e. prevented from being expressed, by another. Here we have an example where genes A and B interact. Gene A codes for enzyme 1 and gene B codes for enzyme 2. Enzyme 1 is coded for by the dominant allele A. The recessive allele codes for a dysfunctional protein. The same is for gene B. The dominant allele codes for enzyme 2 and the recessive allele codes for a dysfunctional protein. Enzyme 1 is responsible for turning a white pigment in flowers into yellow pigment. Enzyme 2 is able to turn this yellow pigment into a red pigment. When working out epistasis situations, I always like to think of it like a flowchart. In this scenario, it would go like this. Can we produce enzyme 1? If no, we stay with white pigment. If yes, what colour do we have? Then, can we produce enzyme 2? If yes, what colour do we have? If no, we stay with yellow pigment. Let's take an example of a genotype that is homozygous recessive for gene A and heterozygous for gene B. Can we produce enzyme 1? No, we can't, as we have two recessive alleles which will result in a dysfunctional protein, so no functional enzyme 1 is produced, so we cannot turn white into yellow pigment. Even though we have a dominant allele of gene B present so that we can make enzyme 2, we can't make enzyme 1 to turn white into yellow pigment in the first place. Note that epistasis can provide difficulties for genetic investigations, because if the effect of one locus is altered or masked by the effects at another locus, the power to detect the first locus is reduced. Very complex interactions can be present when many loci are involved. So finally we need to consider the chi-squared test. What is it used for in the case of genetics? It is used to compare the goodness of fit of observed phenotypic ratios with expected ratios. We could use it to see if there is a dihybrid cross with no linkage, or whether the genes involved are linked. We will rarely get exactly the expected phenotypic ratios for a number of different reasons. These include the random fertilization of gametes, epistasis, or simply by having a small sample size. But we want to see if the difference between the observed and expected outcomes is significant, i.e. are other factors at play. So what do we do? Well, first we need to find chi-squared using the formula here. They'll give you the value for chi-squared in exams, so you don't have to be able to calculate it yourself. Then we compare our result with the critical value. To find the critical value, we need to know something known as our degrees of freedom, which is the number of classes minus one. We use the degrees of freedom to look up our critical value. If our value for chi-squared exceeds or is equal to the critical value, we reject our null hypothesis. Note that in the example with phenotypic ratios, the null hypothesis is that there is no significant difference between the expected and observed phenotypic ratios. If we reject the null hypothesis, there is a less than 5% probability that the difference between the expected and the observed phenotypic ratios is due to chance. Great, that would be this part of the specification covered. We have covered how the genotype is the genetic constitution of an organism and how the phenotype is the expression of this genetic constitution and its interaction with the environment. We have covered how there may be many alleles of a single gene and how these alleles may be dominant, recessive or co-dominant. We have covered how in a diploid organism the alleles at a specific locus may either be homozygous or heterozygous. We should now be able to use fully labelled genetic diagrams to interpret or predict the results of monohybrids and dihybrid crosses involving dominant, recessive and co-dominant alleles, as well as crosses involving sex linkage, autosomal linkage, multiple alleles and epistasis. 
Finally, we should be able to use the chi-squared test to compare the goodness of fit between observed and expected phenotypic ratios. That would be it for now guys, thanks for watching, please subscribe, comment, next time we will be covering populations.